Please turn with me in your Bibles then to 2 Peter. We continue our verse by verse study through the book of 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 1 through 4. 2 Peter chapter 3 verses 1 through 4 reading from God's holy word. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, truth divine, dawn upon this soul of mine, word of God and inward light, wake my spirit, clear my sight. Dearly Father, this is so relevant for our day. May your spirit of truth guide us into this truth, convict us of it, apply it to our minds, hearts, and our wills today. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Friends, we are living in the last days of the last days. Do you believe that? Do we evidence any reality of that belief in our daily lives? Any sense of urgency? Or are we complacent? Are we content merely to let be what will be, will be? Do we have any heart's desire to save the lost from the day of the Lord? Do we know what these terms mean? The last days and the day of the Lord. The last days is the time period between the first and second comings of Christ. It is the church age. I believe it is a remnant age. Luke 17, 26 to 28. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the coming of the, of the Son of Man. As it was in the days of Lot, so it will also be in the coming of the Son of Man. No wonder, Jesus said in Luke 18, 8, He said, when I return, will I find faith on the earth. 1 Timothy 4, 1 and 2, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly in the latter days, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy of the conscience seared with a hot iron. 2 Timothy 4, 3 and 4, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts they will heap up for themselves teachers, because they have itching ears, who will turn away their ears from the truth, and they will be turned aside to fables. Do we believe that the time is short before Jesus Christ returns? Peter believed so. He believed in the doctrine of imminency. 1 Peter 4, 7, But the end is at hand. Therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. And be very mindful. Somebody will say, Oh, Peter, that's 2,000 years ago. Remember 2 Peter 3, 8, One day with the Lord is 1,000 years, and 1,000 years is one day. In one sense, you could say Jesus has been gone for two days. The second coming is the theme of Peter's epistles. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7, And this you greatly rejoice, so now for a little while, if need be, you are grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, which is perishable, though it be tested with fire, may be found to result in praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Christianity is noted for the importance of eschatology, the study of last things. We've been going through this on James on Sunday night, James 5, 7 through 11. Three times it speaks of the coming of Christ there. And why does he speak of the coming of Christ? He speaks of the coming of Christ to persecuted, immature believers in Christ there whose wages are being withheld by fraud and all that. And James says, comfort yourself with the knowledge that Jesus is returning. Jesus is coming. 1 Thessalonians 4.18 and 5.11 says the same thing. Comfort one another with these words. Friends, what does the Bible mean by the day of the Lord? There's two major interpretations. One is Schofield. says the day of the Lord includes the time from the second coming of Christ to the earth, to the new heavens and the new earth after the millennium. In 2 Peter 3.10 But the day of the Lord will come as a thief of the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise. The elements will melt with fervent heat both the earth and the works that are in. They'll be burned up. And the second interpretation of the day of the Lord is from Harry Ironside. 
The day of the Lord begins immediately, he says, after the rapture, when Christ returns uh, in the air, and he includes the tribulation, when God's judgments are poured out on the earth. It includes the second coming of Christ to the earth, Zephaniah 1, 14 through 18, Zechariah 14, 1 through 4. It also includes Christ's thousand-year millennial reign on the earth. Dwight Pentecost, in his book, Things to Come, says this, The day of the Lord is the day of God's wrath. It's the day of His judgment. That extended time period of God's dealings with Israel after the rapture, at the beginning of the trib period, and extending through then the second advent and the millennial age to the creation of the new heavens and the new earth after the millennium. Friends, Peter knew all of this. That were, these were themes of his epistles. Second coming, doctrine of imminency. And then he also included the prevalence of the false teachers as the end nears and their advancing their agenda and their lustful desires. Look at 2 Peter 2, verse 10. And especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lusts of uncleanness, they despise authority, they're presumptuous, they're self-willed, they're not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Look at verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of emptiness, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through lewdness, the ones who have actually escaped from those who live in air. He also said that the scoffers would be coming. And that's in our text today in verses 3 and 4. We should note that throughout the Bible is really grand epics of God's timetable <clears throat> of history about to occur. It coincides with an increase in satanic activity. Satanic activity gets ratcheted up. Consider the time right before the flood in Genesis 6, the time of Lot, the widespread perversion in Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding regions, and only Lot and the two daughters were saved, Genesis 19. Consider the inception of the Israelite people as a nation, the book of Exodus, and then the Exodus itself. And then consider the beginning of the prophetic era, the times of Elijah and Elisha in 1 Kings 17 and following. Consider the 400 silent years then before John the Baptist and Christ's first coming. And then all of the increased satanic opposition that is recorded in the Gospels as Christ is doing his miracles. And friends, so will it be with Christ's second coming. We should not be alarmed by this. We should know that it's coming. Turn with me to, uh, in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. But know this, that in the last days, remember that's the time between Christ's first and second coming, the church age. Know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power from such turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households, make captives of gullible women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I encourage you also to read 2 Thessalonians 2, 5 through 12, and also 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 through 11. And we ask ourselves, does this mark our day? Does this mark our day? Psalm 12, 8. The wicked freely strut about when what is vile is honored among men. Does this mark the professing church? Acts 20, 29 and 30. Remember Paul told the elders at Miletus that after his departure, grievous wolves would come in from the outside, not sparing the flock. And also of them own selves would men arise, speaking perverse things, so as to draw away disciples after themselves. In Matthew 13, 25 and 26, that while men slept, the enemy came in, he sowed tares among the wheat. When the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, the tares also appeared, and they will not be separated until Christ returns at the end of the last days. 1 Corinthians 11:19, 19, knowing that in the meantime there must be factions among you, that those who are approved 
may be made manifest. It is interesting that what is happening outside of the church today that is impacting the church. The church today witnesses no shortage of opponents who have vehemently attacked traditional Christianity and the notions of God's existence. For example, Richard Dawkins' 2006 work, The God Delusion, which attacks the idea of a supernatural being. It's just amazing to me. It reached number two on the Amazon.com bestseller list and number four on the New York Times list. Likewise, Christopher Hitchens reaches recent book, God is Not Great. It reached number one on the New York Times bestseller list. And both authors have enjoyed huge success from their scathing critique and mockery of religion in general and Christianity in particular. Also, you and I should note that there's no shortage of false teachers, scoffers, within the professing church. And remember, this should come as no surprise because Peter said in chapter 2, verse 1, as there were false prophets among the people, there will be false teachers among you also. I encourage you to read Michael Horton's book, Christless Christianity, The Alternative Gospel of the American Church. Within that book, there's one chapter on Joel Osteen, a whole chapter on him. And as John MacArthur says, Joel Osteen is a pagan religionist, a quasi-pantheist, and an agent of Satan. I also encourage you to read Ray Youngren's A Time of Departing, How Ancient Mystical Practices Are Uniting Christians with the World's Religions. And in that book, there is an entire chapter on Rick Warren. He quotes Rick Warren. Rick Warren says, I'm looking for a second reformation. The first reformation of the church 500 years ago was about beliefs. This one is going to be about behavior. The first one was about creeds. This one is going to be about deeds. It's not going to be about what does the church believe, but about what the church is doing. You see that smacks of 2 Timothy 4, 3 and, and 4. Well, they heap up for themselves teachers because they have itching ears who will turn away themselves from the truth, the body of doctrine, and they'll be turned aside to fables. Rick Warren was cited by Christianity Today as America's pastor. Friends, this is why Peter's epistles are so relevant for our day. Matthew 16, 3, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but can you discern the signs of the times? Hebrews 5, 14, strong meat belongs to those who are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Romans 13, 11, and do this knowing the time that now it's high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. Revelation 3.22, he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What is our defense against scoffers? The first point is remember the purpose of God's word. Remember the purpose of God's word, verse 1. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. Paul addresses saints here. Agape toy, beloved. This is different from Adelphoi, which James refers to in his epistle 15 times. When you look at Adelphoi with the brethren, you have to look at the context, whether they are believers or not. But every time in Scripture when you see this word beloved, agape toy, it always refers to believers in Christ. Peter here is writing this second epistle to the same audience as the first epistle. 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, that over 300 square miles of what is today modern Turkey. Peter had the same purpose in both epistles, to warn, to remind his readers of the false teachers in their midst. We went all through that extensively in chapter 2 of 2 Peter. They deny the key Bible truths, but especially the second coming and the doctrine of imminency. And they would pad their own pocket and they would allure the gullible to follow their lustful ways. Again, chapter 2, verse 10 and verse 18, as we've already read. Peter's advice 
to the believers would be the same to respond to these false teachers like the Apostle John did to the Gnostic Serenthus. When John was in Ephesus and he was going into the public bathhouse and he heard that the Gnostic Serenthus was in that bathhouse, John turned around and fled as fast as his old legs could carry him out of there because he feared that God would strike that bathhouse and kill everybody who was in it, including Serenthus. If Peter had warned his readers once of false teachers, he'd warned them a thousand times. Peter believed in the need for constant reminders. You remember in chapter 1, 12 through 15, three times there he cites that word, remind you, remind you, remind you. For this reason I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these, th these things, though you know them and you're established in the present truth. You couple that with a need then for the Holy Spirit's filling, indwelling, restraining, guiding, convicting, continual presence. Oh, to grace how great a debtor daily I am constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering soul, soul to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Peter, as the pastor, was concerned for the state of his reader's souls and walk and he knew that they needed not only he needed not only to teach and to preach and to admonish restrain prod and encourage via reminders and prayer but he needed to lead also by example Martin Lloyd Jones says good teachers repeat themselves Peter said the repetition here in this verse he says was to stir them up it's the same word he used in chapter 1 verse 13 yes I think it right as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by way of reminding you. To stir up, digairo in the Greek, it means to rouse to action. The action being what? Peter wanted to arouse them to pure, wholesome thinking. And what is the end then of the pure, wholesome thinking? It is in 1 Timothy 6.3. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness. Friends, godliness is the heart of truth. Peter also used the same word for mind here, dianoia, as he did in chapter 1, verse 13. It's the faculty of knowing. It's the same word that's found in Matthew 22, 37. You'll love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. And I just wish that there were so many professing Christians today would re realize that we are, as Christians, to be thinking people, critical thinkers. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, the mind is the highest created faculty in man. But we also know that it's subject to decay. And what is the result if we lack repetition? What's the result of aging? Our mind needs to constantly be fed God truths. We need to retrace old ground and we need to break new ground in our progressive sanctification. 2 Peter 3.18 But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Then we couple that with the Holy Spirit's illumination and enabling so by God's grace we go from milk to meat then as Hebrews 5.14 says so we can discern or judge between good and evil. And if so, then and only then will we stand against these false teachers and their perverted, lustful teaching in these last days and then have right thinking and walk in the light of the eschaton, which is Christ's imminent return. Friends, is that our heart's desire? What is our defense against scoffers? The first point is to remember the purpose of God's word. The second point is to remember the purity of God's word. Remember the purity of God's word. Verse 2, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Friends, Peter reminds his readers here of the truthfulness of the Old Testament. That's the phrase here, clause, the words spoken before by the holy prophets. Peter also reminds his readers of the truthfulness of the New Testament scriptures. That's the clause and of commandment of us, the apostles, and of the Lord and Savior. Psalm 12, 6. Every word of God is a pure word. Pure words. 
In Proverbs 30, verse 5, every word of God is pure. He's a shield to those who put their trust in Him. Psalm 119, 160, the words of the Lord are pure in their entirety. John 17, 17, sanctify them according to Thy word. Thy word is truth. What is truth? John MacArthur says, it is the self-expression of God. And R.C. Sproul says, it is the revelation of God. Friends, the apostles spoke the truth of God. Paul said in 1 Timothy 2.7, I speak the truth of God and I lie not. They follow in the steps of God. God said in Titus 1.2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Notice in verse 2 here, a better translation in the Greek is your apostles rather than the apostles. You might want to write that there someplace in your Bible there above that. Your apostles rather than the apostles. Why is that better? It's to note the special relationship the apostles had with the church. I think of Jesus in his high priestly prayer, John 17, 20. He says, I do not pray for the disciples, the apostles only, but for those who will believe in them through, believe in me through their word. Believe in me through their word. Peter knew that what he spoke here was the inspired word of God. What do we mean when we say the inspired word of God? Dr. Dan Block says inspiration, the simplest meaning of inspiration is God gets written what he wants written. God gets written what he wants written. In 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is theonoistus. It is God breathed out, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. In 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21, we have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereon do you do well that you take heed as a light in your heart, as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise. Knowing this first, no prophecy of the scriptures, any private interpretation, for prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved or carried along by the Holy Spirit. Friends, what Peter wrote here was direct revelation from God. John Owen says, revelation denotes immediate informative communication from God, disclosing things which could not otherwise have been known. The apostle here, such as Peter, he had a direct commissioning from God. 1 Corinthians 9.16 Paul said, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. Peter here, like Paul, was under compulsion to proclaim God's revealed truth. I can't help but think of of Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 20. He said he was on derision daily from those just by speaking the word that the antagonists against him. And what did he say? He says, I'm going to shut up. I'm not going to say anymore. But he says, it's a fire in my bones and I can't shut up even if I want to. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32 and 33, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. So we ask ourselves, friends, do we as Christians have a compulsion to share the gospel? Or is it just for pastors and professional Christian workers? Friends, the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19, and 20 is for all Christians. Our testimony should be that of the hymn writer who said, I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory of Jesus and his love. Look at the end of verse 2. It says, Lord and Savior. Those words there were used of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's one article in the Greek for both titles, and that refers to the same person. These are holy commands. Chapter 2, verse 21, uses the same word at the end to turn from the holy commandment delivered him. They were moral standards. They were incumbent on believers from very God of God himself. Friends, the issue in this verse is the authority of Scripture. The authority of Scripture. The words of the apostles are the words of Jesus. 
They're the very words of God. They are absolutely pure words. The whole matter of dealing with his false teachers is they do not believe in the authority of Scripture. They do not believe sola scriptura. Today we have the emergent church. And they do not believe in propositional revelation. They do not believe in absolute doctrinal truths. One of the large megachurches in Wilmer, the pastor quotes from emergent church leaders but does not cite who he's quoting. And the emergent church, friends, does not believe in the authority of Scripture. Scripture's authority is subsumed under the authority of the community. They reject sola scriptura in the favor of a dialogue between Scripture, reason, tradition, and experience, none of which can stand alone as a norm. R.C. Sproul says, only Scripture is the authority to bind our conscience absolutely because only God is the authority to set obligations upon us absolutely and because the Scripture is His Word, it alone bears this singular authority. Friends, do we believe that? Do we believe the doctrine, the incarnation, the resurrection, the second coming, the forgiveness of sins, the substitutional penal atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross? The natural mind cannot grasp these things as truth. And the farther they harden themselves from the truth, the more they hate it and the more they will oppose it. Revelation, friends, is beyond reason. Augustine said, God does not expect us to submit our faith with him without reason, but the very limits of our reason make faith a necessity. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Spiritual hearing requires illumination of the spirit to accept scripture as true and binding on us. Illumination is the application of God's revealed word to our hearts by the Holy Spirit. So we grasp as reality what the sacred text says for ourselves. What is our defense against scoffers? The first point is remember the purpose of God's word. The second point is remember the purity of God's word. The third point is to remember the perversion of God's word. Verses 3 and 4, the perversion of God's word. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Friends, why do these false teachers oppose God's word? What's the bottom line? The bottom line is they do not want to be accountable. They don't want to be judged. They don't want Christ to be Lord and Master over them. They want to define their own moral standards. They want to walk according to their own lusts. Chapter 2, verse 10 and 18 again. What they want is the time of the judges. Judges 21, 25, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So the question arises, what was their response then to God's word? This, these verses answer it. They scoff, they mock. They ridicule, they malign, they impugn, they disdain, they denigrate, they mix the truth with, the, with air, they redact God's word. What does it mean to redact? We live in an age of redactionism. Revision of history today, revision of our founding documents, revision of creeds, redactism. What does it mean? It means that you take an established set of terms that have a long-standing meaning and then you redefine those terms then to meet your own set of ideas, your own belief system, your own tastes. What does God say in response to redactism? Revelation 22, 18, 19, you add on to his words, you get all the plagues that are in this book. You take away from his words, God takes your name out of the book of life. And in Scripture, remember, the adders to God's Word were the Pharisees. The subtractors from God's Word were the Sadducees. False teachers, whether they're philosophers, scientists, educators, pastors, religious leaders, whomever, they accept physical laws, absolute physical laws, 
but they will not accept absolutes in the spiritual realm or the moral realm. There they desire flexibility and leeway as to the situation. Friends, God is consistent. He has absolute physical laws as well as absolute spiritual and moral laws. They always work. They cannot be bypassed. They cannot be avoided ultimately. Galatians 6, 7, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man sows, that shall he also reap. Jesus said in John 12, 48, He who rejects me and receives not my word is one, is one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same will judge him in the last days. Friends, how should we respond to these false teachers and their presence among us and these scoffers and mockers? No surprise, no surprise at all. The naysayers, scoffers of God's word and people have always been with us. Chapter 2, verse 1, again, as Peter said, it goes way back to the Garden of Eden. Genesis 3, 1 through 5, the serpent was a scoffer and a mocker. Hath God said, surely you will not die. I think of the time of Nehemiah in 445 B.C. He was dealing with Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem. And the ridicule and mocking they received as they were building, rebuilding the walls in those 52 days and restoring the gates. And you know, they were, they were mocked and ridiculed. All these weak and feeble people, they'll never be able to do that. Why, if a fox walked on their walls, it would, the walls would crumble. Let scoffers laugh and say our work is vain and mocking ask, where is our gain? Such scoffers die and are forgot, but work done for God, it dieth not. You see, friends, the Bible says that these scoffers, mockers are going to come in the end times and this is an indication and a sign that the end is near and a truthfulness of God's word. Look at verse 4. That records the content of the scoffer's teaching. What's a promise? A promise is a divine intention for the future that are sure as to God's actions which bring comfort to his people. The word for coming here in verse 4 is parousia. We went over this on Sunday night, going through James 5, 7 through 11. It's over 500 times in the New Testament. And the emphasis of the word coming here, perusia, is presence. As William Barclay say, the best way to prepare for the coming of Christ is never to forget the presence of Christ. The question here of these mockers and scoffers is skepticism. It's a denial of the truth of the promise of God as to Christ's return. Friends, it's blasphemy. It is taking God's name in vain. Exodus 20, verse 7. Isaiah 55, 11. God says, So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I send it. Engraved as in eternal brass, the mighty promise shines, nor can the powers of darkness raise those everlasting lines. Just think in the psalmist day. Psalm 73, 11. How does God know? Is there knowledge with the Most High? Just think in Jeremiah's day. Jeremiah 17, 15. Where is the word of the Lord? In Ezekiel's day, 12, 22. The days go by and one vision comes to nothing. In Malachi's day, Malachi 2, 17. Where is the God of justice? In Peter's day, 3, 4, for since the fathers fell asleep, that is a euphemism that they died, just as in 1 Corinthians eleven thirty. 30, for since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were since the beginning of creation. Friends, is that true? Well, of course not. In the next verses, Peter gives evidence to deny that perpetual sameness where he cites the universal flood. These false teachers, what do they do? They conveniently leave out information, evidence that does not fit their non-Christian worldview. Nothing new under the sun. What do we have going on today with this political spin that is very selective and partial? I think of the events. You've probably been following them on the news. The events surrounding the Benghazi murders. Nothing but cover-ups and lies. Events surrounding the Boston Marathon bombings. Nothing but cover-up, spin, lies. The unemployment figures, lies. Obamacare expenses, lies. So too in the 
religious arena with the open theists and their denial of God's omniscience and His omnipresence. Friends, what is the finality of all this spin? Historically, and down through the ages, we know that with a biblical point of view, history is headed towards a final consummation. As God's words proclaim, these false teachers will be judged for their sins. Psalm 50, verse 21. These things you have done, and I kept silent. You thought I was altogether such a one as yourself. But I will reprove you and set things order before your eyes. Exodus 34, 7. God will in no wise clear the guilty. Friends, you can sow wild oats in the spring. And harvest doesn't come until months later. But it does come. Jesus said in John 5, 28 and 29, Marvel not at this. The hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. What's our defense against scoffers? Three points this morning. Remember the purpose of God's word. Remember the purity of God's word. And remember the perversion of God's word. In his classic book, and I would encourage you to read it, Evangelicalism Divided by Ian Murray. R.C. Sproul says, next to the Word of God, this is the book. He has given an accurate critique of modern evangelicalism that concurs with Peter in our admonition, warning, and discernment. Ian Murray says this, The biblical portrait of false teachers is very clear. While they profess to speak for God, they mislead people over the true condition in God's sight. They do not speak faithfully to the unconverted, they are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Isaiah 56.10 They are men pleasers. They have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying peace, peace, when there is no peace. Jeremiah 6.14 They have spoken lying words in my name, which I have not commanded them. Jeremiah 29.23 The long-term effect of such influence is certain. For from the prophets of Jerusalem, profanity has gone out throughout all the land. Jeremiah 23, 15. The consequence is moral decay and finally judgment. They mock the messengers of God. They despise God's word. They scoff at his prophets until the wrath of God arose against his people and there was no remedy. 2 Chronicles 36, 16. Friends, the decay of Christianity in the 20th century is not the result of sociological and secular pre pressures. Spiritual decline is not a mystery which Scripture leaves unexplained. It's the result of presence of falsehood where there should be truth. Jeremiah 23, 21 and 22, God says, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they would stood in my counsel and caused my people to hear my words, then they would have turned from the evil ways and their evil doings. Friends, the parallels in history are unmistakable. False teaching always brings the church to impotence and contempt. The issue in our day is not ecumenism. It's not unity. What is needed today is gospel truth. What we first need is gospel truth. We need sola scriptura again, just like the first reformation. We can be sure that it will not be dressed effectively until there's a renewed anointing of power upon those who claim the name of Christ, the, whose only authority is the Word of God. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, I just thank you for your Word of Truth. These are sober words. These are words of warning. These are words, dear Holy Father, that were inspired words from you through Peter to us. Dear Holy Father, in light of all the false teachers around us, without side, outside the professing church, but also within the professing church. Give us, dear Holy Father, by your spirit of truth, discernment, wisdom. May we speak the truth in love. May we proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, but also give an apologia, so we can discern between truth and error, and your kingdom can move forward, your great commission. And we will be a part of that.